Hi, I'm Jennifer Wyack from The Ohio State University. And I'm Adam Kate, also from The Ohio State University. We're happy to be here at ASH 21 in Atlanta, Georgia, speaking to Vijay Hemank about CLL and the exciting abstracts that were presented here. Um, we'll start off by talking about some of the exciting abstracts that were presented in the treatment knife setting. Um, I think there were uh, four uh, abstracts to talk about here. One was the Captivate study, uh, where we saw some uh, follow-up data of the patients who had undetectable minimal residual disease who received Ibrutinib plus venetoclax for 15 cycles and then were randomized to either placebo or continued Ibrutinib. So we also have the GLOW study, which also combined ibrutinib plus venetoclax uh, for 15 cycles and it compared it to chlorambucil plus obinutuzumab. And lastly, we had CLL13, which was a combination study of various venetoclax regimens, either with obinutuzumab, rituximab, or ibrutinib, and it was compared to patients who got chemoimmunotherapy. And so I think there's a, a take-home point here on all these studies, is that I think the exciting thing about treatment-naive uh, CLL is that we might have a new indication of ibrutinib plus venetoclax for the frontline setting. And the question is, where does this fall when we have so many other good options for CLL, including ibrutinib um, or a calibrutinib plus minus obinutuzumab or venetoclax plus obinutuzumab? And so I think all of these different studies kind of answer a small, different question when we are looking at this as the big picture. So let's start with the GLOW trial, right? So the GLOW trial was a registrational study. So the goal of this study was to get a FDA-approved indication for ibrutinib plus venetoclax, and it compared it to chlorambucil plus obinutuzumab. So I think the biggest um, complaint about this study is that chlorambucil plus obinutuzumab is not typically used in the frontline setting anymore in patients who have CLL in, in America. And so a lot of people think that this particular comparator arm is not the best comparator arm. So it was no surprise that ibrutinib plus venetoclax met its primary endpoint and was superior to chlorambucil obinutuzumab. But it doesn't help us answer where we should place this combination therapy uh, moving forward. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the Captivate study? Yeah, so the Captivate study is a phase two trial. It's a really interesting design. So there's two cohorts, a uh, MRD cohort where the d depth of minimal residual disease at the end of the one year of therapy determined whether patients continued with uh, maintenance ibrutinib or discontinued. Um, the other cohort was fixed duration, where everybody got the same amount of ibrutinib plus venetoclax, and then everybody stopped therapy. So what we heard here at ASH was um, a follow-up of the MRD cohort. And we see that really at this point, it, it seems like it doesn't matter whether patients who have undetectable MRD continue on with maintenance, ibrutinib, or placebo. Same thing with patients who have detectable MRD, where they were randomized to either ibrutinib or ibrutinib plus venetoclax. Um, we have about a year additional follow-up from what we saw last year, and excitingly, really not any more progressions. Um, so it does appear that this is, at least in the short term, a durable regimen. And um, I think, importantly, it is confirming what we've seen in some smaller studies of either the doublet of ibrutinib plus venetoclax or the triplet with obinutuzumab, where the studies that have come before this one also showed very durable remissions. And then lastly, we have the CLL13 study, which was the one that combined venetoclax with either an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody, rituximab or obinutuzumab, or venetoclax plus ibrutinib plus obinutuzumab. And it compared it, these three um, regimens, to chemoimmunotherapy, whether it bendamustine rituximab or FCR. And I think, once again, uh, we all weren't surprised that it met its primary endpoint, that the venetoclax arms uh, were found to be superior to the chemoimmunotherapy arms, which was exciting to see. I think some of the interesting points about this particular trial was that uh, the, obin of the, the uh, obinutuzumab plus venetoclax arm and the ibrutinib venetoclax obinutuzumab arm had very high rates of MRD, higher than 80%. And what was interesting was that the rituximab plus venetoclax arm only had MRD rates about 50% and was not superior to the chemoimmunotherapy. So we all thought that was very interesting, that the rituximab just appeared to not look as good as the obinutuzumab. And it also begs the question of whether or not adding ibrutinib to the venetoclax obinutuzumab has any benefit? And I don't think we're going to have the answer to this question until we see results of maybe the CLL17 trial, which is a phase three trial that compares ibrutinib to ibrutinib venetoclax to venetoclax obinutuzumab. And that trial is 
um, powered to show if there's a difference between those three arms as opposed to CLL13, which wasn't powered to show a difference in the venuclax as far as I understand the trial to be. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that you know all three of these trials are really exciting because we're looking at Ibrunib plus venetoclax um, in three different ways of giving the medications. And I think that we'll probably have an FDA approved indication for Ibrunib venetoclax in the near future. But I think the question remains, where will it fall in terms of competing with the other treatment naive arm, a treatment naive uh, re regimens that we have currently? And I think you know some of the studies that are going to answer that question are the current NCTN trials, the Alliance AO41702 study in older patients, and the ECOG 1912 study in younger patients. And those were um, both studies comparing a doublet of ibrutinib obinutuzumab to the triplet ibrutinib obinutuzumab venetoclax. And hopefully, we'll start to answer some of those important questions. Um, also, at ASH this year in the frontline setting, we've seen longer-term follow-up on both the Alliance AO41202 study and the Sequoia study study of Xanabrutinib. So the Alliance study was a three-arm trial that was designed to compare ibrutinib-based regimens to chemoimmunotherapy in patients over the age of 65. So um, the chemoimmunotherapy arm was uh, bendamustine rituximab, and patients also were randomized to either ibrutinib or ibrutinib plus rituximab. So now we have a 55-month uh, medium follow-up, and at four years, we see that the ibrutinib and the ibrutinib plus rituximab arm still have a similar progression-free survival at about um, 75%, and the bendamustine plus rituximab arm is still inferior to that with a, a progression-free survival at that point of 47%. Um, importantly, and what is another common theme that I think has come out at ASH this year is that in the frontline setting, some of these high-risk genetic abnormalities don't seem to play a role, um, most notably 17 p deletion and TP53 mutation. So we always have thought of this as our most high-risk abnormality in CLL, and indeed in the relapse setting with even our novel therapies, um, it appears that patients with uh, TP53 abnormalities have inferior outcomes. Um, but with the Alliance follow-up as well as a retrospective study that was done at MD Anderson, um, it looks like in the frontline setting that may not be the case. Maybe we'll see that with longer-term follow-up, but it's hard to say at this time. Um, we also saw a uh, longer-term follow-up of the Sequoia study, which is a randomized uh, study of Xanabrutinib versus bendamustine rituximab in patients who do not have 17p deletion. There's another arm on the study for patients with 17p deletion that was presented where they received um, uh, Xanabrutinib in that arm as well. Um, in the primary comparison, so the non-17p deleted, uh, we do see, as you would expect, a progression-free survival advantage for xanabrutinib compared to bendamustine rituximab that looks really excellent and pretty similar to what we've seen with uh, both ibrutinib and acalabrutinib in this setting. Um, importantly, in those patients with 17p deletion, we actually see about the same um, PFS at the time point that we have, which is only two years, um, but again, something that we're going to be watching really closely in the future. And I think also what was exciting about this study, it showed once again that Xanabrutinib had a very low rate of atrial fibrillation, which we're already, always worried about when we put patients on um, Ibrutinib. And so that was exciting to see. Um, Let's move on to the relapse refractory data. How about that? Yeah, so you know, just like in the treatment naive setting, there was a lot of interesting data coming out in the relapse refractory setting. Um, to me, one of the uh, most important and influential um, abstracts we saw were two of the reversible BTK inhibitors, and these are pirtovirtinib and MK1026. Um, so both of these molecules bind to Brunsteris and kinase or BTK in a different site than the covalent inhibitors do, and rather than binding irreversible they bind reversibly. So initially, they are kind of strategized to play a role primarily in patients who have developed resistance mutations to the covalent BTK inhibitors. Um, so we saw a very short-term follow-up with both of these drugs. Pirtabrunib has pre been presented multiple times, and uh, I think on this presentation, there was actually 100 more patients than we saw last time. It is looking like a very excellent drug in this setting. Uh, many of the patients had received a BTK inhibitor and a BTK CL2 inhibitor. Some had even received also a PA3 kinase inhibitor and chemoimmunotherapy. And the response rates were around 65%, actually in just about every one of those subgroups, which is pretty impressive. 
Uh, we don't really know much about progression-free survival for the majority of patients. However, they did show that the double refractory patients, BTK and BCL2 inhibitor refractory patients, had a median progression-free survival of about 18 months at this time, uh, which is notably better than anything else we have to offer these patients. The other thing that I thought was really interesting about pirtabrunib is that, remember, pirtabrunib acts on BTK, and the subsequent molecule after BTK is PCL, PLC gamma 2. And so when patients uh, become resistant to our first generation BTK inhibitors, uh, they usually have a BTK C481S mutation, and sometimes they also have a PLC gamma 2, which is downstream of the BTK. So I thought it was super interesting that it seemed to look like it worked, and someone even asked a question about this, in patients who had both a BTK mutation as well as a PLC C gamma 2 mutation. I think the number of patients was quite small. If I remember correctly, it was like 23. And so I'd like to see further follow-up from that. But I thought that was super interesting. What do you think about that? Yeah, I also, I think that's really interesting also. The other piece of information that I would love for them to share in a previous, in a subsequent presentation is what exactly are those mutations? Because there's actually yeah. a lot of um, SNPs in PLC gamma 2 and, you know, a few kind of verified hotspot mutations that we know um, can't have the potential to drive resistance to the covalent inhibitors. So yeah, I, I I also thought that that was a really interesting point. And then also the safety data looked remarkable for pirtabrunib as yep. well, right? Yep, so pirtabrunib is a really, really selective BTK inhibitor, probably the most selective that we've seen in cl clinical development so far. And as a consequence of that, it has a remarkably clean safety profile. So um, I think that the toxicities that they even mentioned, things like fatigue, I think there was some, a little bit of bruising, um, were kind of things that you expect to see just in patients with CLL in general, which was really exciting to see. Yeah, and so I think when they look at where they're taking pirtonibrunib from here, you know, there's some exciting trials on the horizon. You know, I think one that, you know, strikes to me is uh, they're doing pirtonibrunib plus venetoclax plus rituximab versus, uh, as a randomized phase three trial, venetoclax plus rituximab in the second line setting. So I think those things are really exciting. Yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, and then the other reversible BTK inhibitor that was presented was MK1026. This was formerly known as ARQ531 in previous presentations. Um, this is kind of the opposite of pirtabrutinib in terms of selectivity. So this is actually a really non-specific BTK inhibitor. Um, and with that having potentially an advantage in some senses that it is actually a little bit more cytotoxic than pirtabrutinib to CLL cells specifically. Um, so this study as well uh, had quite a few less patients than the pirtabrutinib study. Um, we were presenting the data for patients who were included on the dose expansion cohort um, at the previous recommended phase two dose of 65 milligrams daily. Um, and we saw a response rate of about 58% in those patients. So still really excellent in these very heavily pretreated patients. Again, most of them were BTK and BCL2 inhibitor refractory. Um, again, very short follow-up. So duration of remission is really unknown. But, you know, at least in the short term, it is looking um, like you have some very nice remissions. Um, the toxicity profile it is probably a little bit less clean than we see with pirtabrutinib just because it has so many other targets. Um, but it was a general uh, very well tolerated molecule too. There was um, some rashes, some GI side effects, and dyskusia, um, but most of those things were not therapy limiting. So I have two questions for you. Is it nemtarutinib? I saw the name of it, or yeah. nemtarutinib? How do you say it? I'm not really sure. Okay, we'll find <laughs> out. Um, and I guess the next question is, where do you see these two molecules fitting in in the treatment paradigm for CLL? Yeah, so I think that that is just a million dollar question right yeah. now. Um, and certainly they've, I think, proven once, obviously we have a a phase three study showing against a comparator, but I think they've really proven themselves to have activity and potentially a role for these patients that have progressed despite our other um, standard therapy options, specifically those who had received a BTK and a BCL2 inhibitor. Um, I think that it's really tempting even in the relapse setting to say, hey, we would like to continue in the same class. And so patients who were on a BTK inhibitor initially, maybe transitioning them to a reversible BTK inhibitor rather than going straight to venetoclax at that point. Um, and then as as well, both of those drugs are being moved into studies in the frontline setting. Um, and I think it, it'll just take some time, I think, to understand what's going to be their role in that really upfront group, but I think that they've already established the potential role in the relapse setting. Yeah, because I think it's super exciting that peer to brutinib appears to have a great adverse event profile, but the question remains, if you have somebody who's on peer to brutinib as a frontline treatment, will they develop resistance like we've seen with the brutinib and acalabrutinib? Mm -hmm. And well, then what will we do after that? Can we use another type of BTK? inhibitor is really unclear at that point. And so I, I think it's very interesting that we're moving it forward. I think a lot of us are worried that they're going to develop some sort of resistance mechanism moving forward as well. Mm -hmm.
So what about some basic research um, abstracts that you've seen? What do you think is interesting? Yeah, so there is actually quite a lot of molecules in preclinical development that are looking really exciting for CLL, new targets, new therapies. You know, a couple ones that I just kind of wanted to mention. Um, one is a CDK9 inhibitor, and this is VIP152. Um, and there was a oral presentation looking at this in patients with CLL, patient samples uh, with CLL as well as uh, mouse models. Looking really exciting. And, you know, we've seen um, previous CDK inhibitors be active even in refractory CLL, drugs like flavopyridol and dinocyclib. Um, they really hadn't moved very far in development. Um, this drug, we hope, has the potential to, to move even further. Um, and as well, potentially have some activity in Richter's transformation as well as CLL. Um, another one that we've seen is a dual BCL2, BCL XL inhibitor called LP118. Um, and this is a drug that binds BCL2 a little bit differently than venetoclax does, so potentially could be active in patients who have BCL2 mutations, and as well has some weak activity on BCL XL, um, which is another way that patients can become resistant to BCL2 inhibitors by upregulating some of those other BH3 anti apoptotic proteins. Um, and so, again, in CLL cells, patients either sensitive to or resistant to venetoclax, as well as mouse models, um, it does look like this drug has some potential activity. So, um, you know, these are just a couple of examples. Many more um, have been presented, but I think that the uh, outlook for studies in CLL is really bright, and we just have a lot of exciting things moving forward. Yeah, and I think the last part that I thought was really interesting about this, Ash, is that, you know, I think undetectable minimal residual disease is really being highlighted as an endpoint that we need to strive for. And I think moving forward, we need to figure out um, how deep does undetectable minimal residual disease need to be? Does it need to be to the 10 to negative 4 or 10 to negative 6? Is it good enough to be in the peripheral blood? Is it good enough to be in the bone marrow? And what does that mean for our patients? Which patients can we stop therapy on? So I'm excited to see this, uh, not, not necessarily new, but this endpoint being evaluated appropriately um, and also maybe uh, clinically relevant as we move forward in our treatment CLL. So I think there's a lot of exciting things in CLL and I'm, I'm looking forward to the future. Yep, absolutely. Well, do you have any other comments that you want to make? No, I, I, I think the last comment, well, I should say yes, because the last comment is I'm just happy to be here with my colleagues um, and get to see everybody in person as opposed to virtually. So I think that's been a really good thing about ASH 2021 as well. Yeah, absolutely. That has definitely been a real treat. Thank you for being with us today. We're really excited again to be here with Vijay Hemong highlighting ASH 2021. Thank you.